This is the story of one of the most beautiful mountain locations in all of California. Blessed with glorious vistas, it is a recreational heaven for those who treasure unspoiled nature. Its trails are blazed for hikers of all ages and degrees of energy and stamina, and for riders who want to sample the horseback experience both nearby and into the backcountry wilderness. Its streams invite fishermen who hope to fill their creels with trout. Its predictable winds and beautiful natural setting make it one of the all-time best sailing locations in the country. And its winter wonders invite skiers who come to enjoy the downhill thrills of fresh fallen powder. And because this special mountain place is so rich in dramatic history, it is also the story of lost pilots, crashed bombers, and a burning forest that threatened lives and homes before it was finally extinguished. But most of all, this is the story of water, which begins in drops of melting snow, then continues its downhill destiny in thundering creeks and waterfalls to fill the lakes which so beautifully define this particular spot in the central Sierra, and to turn the generators in powerhouses far below to provide electric energy for much of Southern California. And it all happened right here in this special Sierra area so dramatically enriched by its thundering waters. It all began with a visionary engineer and California mountain man named John Eastwood, who hiked hundreds of high Sierra miles to confirm his belief that water from melted snow in these special mountains could be harnessed to create electric energy. In his mind's eye, Eastwood could see that water captured and contained in Big Creek Basin, or Huntington Lake as we know it today. And he could imagine still other lakes, all connected with tunnels and pipelines leading to powerhouses below where giant generators would convert the potential energy of the lake water into large amounts of inexpensive electricity. Which, as it turned out, was exactly what a wealthy Southern California empire builder named Henry Huntington was looking for to power his fleet of Los Angeles streetcars. But John Eastwood, for all his world-class vision, was an engineer, not an investment banker or financier. And while the Big Creek Project was his brainchild, he lacked the money to develop it. But Henry Huntington had plenty of money, and he could hardly wait to develop it. Fire in the hole! So Huntington's company, together with others, began work in 1911 on an immense and complicated task. They called it the Big Creek Project, and from the very first, it incorporated the biggest and the best that technology could produce. The biggest generators, the strongest pipes, the biggest Pelton wheels, and the highest voltage transmission lines to carry the electricity to Los Angeles. Add the biggest trucks, the crookedest railroad, the longest tunnels, the steepest cliffs, the rockiest roads, the most dynamite, and the bravest engineers. And you can see that Henry Huntington meant business in a big way. But job one was to capture and hold the plunging waters of Big Creek by building three massive concrete dams in the Basin Reservoir. As the construction efforts gained momentum, it became increasingly necessary to create some way to get men and materials up the mountain. The thousands of tons of cement, lumber, pipe, and other necessary building materials simply couldn't be hauled by horse or mule team because it was just too slow, costly, and clumsy. Solution? Build a railroad. And they did. So a moment for the story of the San Joaquin and Eastern, or as it was called by rail historian Hank Johnston in his excellent book, the railroad that lighted Southern California. All aboard for Dry Creek, Wellborn, Indian, Mission, Shaver, Crossing, Camp Sierra, and Cascada! All aboard! 
Oh, the San Joaquin and Eastern was a funny railroad line. Its tracks were steep and twisty, and it seldom ran on time. Its engines all were noisy as they huffed and chugged along. They sure weren't fast or built to last, but brother, they were strong. The San Joaquin and Eastern, born 1912, died 1933. But in its short, colorful life, its trains chugged up and down the cliffs and canyons from El Prado to Big Creek and back again, hauling men and materials to build the lakes, dams, and powerhouses needed by the project. So all aboard for the San Joaquin and Eastern, <laughs> or as it was better known to its passengers, the slow, jerky, and expensive. That's the route it took, all the way from El Prado, south of Fryant, down there on the left, to Big Creek, up there on the right, with Auberry in between. 56 miles of twisty, turny, up again, down again railroad track, laid by a bunch of men doing their hard, grimy, dangerous work, 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and all for about 25 cents an hour. When it officially opened for business in 1912, it's 56 miles of track, had 255 curves, beyond all doubt the steepest and crookedest railway ever built in this country. Oh, the San Joaquin and Eastern, it has a twisty track. On Monday, it goes up the hill, and Tuesday, it slides back. Its engineers are fearless, and their whistles often blow. You'd think that they were going fast. They're only going slow. Speed limit down in the valley was 20 miles an hour. But when the trains hit the grade from Auberry to Big Creek, it was more like six miles an hour. But man, did it make a lot of noise. As mountain historian Charlie Hull tells it, Not only was the ride on the fg &E, slow, jerky, and expensive, but it was terribly noisy. Every train, when it goes around a curve, squeals. Well, now, the trouble with this road is there were so many curves, one right after the other, that it was almost one continuous squeal after they got into the mountain part of the country. As the SJ&E timetable said, the whole 56-mile trip would take more than five hours, with the arrival at Big Creek at about 1.45 p.m., that is, if the train didn't run off the tracks or hit some farmer's cow. If you wanted to get somewhere fast, you could hop a rail car. At least you could if you were an executive like those serious-looking guys who might have been using it for an official inspection or an unofficial deer hunt. Larger groups could take the rail bus, called the White Elephant by disgruntled riders who, who thought it was one of the worst things on rails. But for most passengers, it was a passenger car, or in good weather, an excursion car like that, which was really just a flat car with seats. But it provided great views, and pure mountain smells too, <laughs> except when the air was polluted with the clouds of smoke and steam from the engine up front, which it usually was. The engine up front. If the railroad made the project possible, that's the huffing, chuffing little engine that made the railroad possible. And that's the distinguished gentleman who made the engine possible. Ephraim Shea, a Michigan lumberman who needed the world's strongest locomotive to drag logs out of his forest back east. So, he sat down and designed an engine so strong it could drag anything out of anywhere. Couldn't go very fast, and like all steam locomotives, it had to be oiled all the time but it was the best engine to pull men and materials up the steep grade from Auberry to Big Creek. The secret was in the side-mounted cylinders and revolving gears that made every wheel a driving wheel. So, lots of smoke, lots of steam, lots of horsepower, and lots of noise to startle the deer. The speed? Well, not much with the Shea engine, folks. Sorry about that. While the SJ&E had rail cars, bus cars, box cars, even an observation car and caboose. For sure, it didn't have any dining cars for the care and feeding of its passengers. But not to worry, folks, because the conductor would take your order for a box lunch 
and phone it ahead to the station at Stevenson Creek, where hardworking ladies would assemble a sandwich, apple, cookie, and cold coffee in a cardboard cup. Problem was that the ride was so jerky, bouncing, and smelly that a lot of passengers got sick, as Don Potts remembers. Remember getting on that train coming up to Big Creek, and all I can remember about the whole trip, I was so sick, I was offered some pie by the conductor, and I couldn't eat it. But food and fun for everyone? Sure. Especially when the train crews would worry new passengers with stories of bloody wrecks, because the curves ahead were simply too sharp to get around safely or scary warnings that the rickety trestles far above would collapse with the weight of the train. Of course, the trestles were really water flumes from Shaver Lake, but the frightened passengers didn't know that. But frightened or not, there were always a lot of riders. And while most were project workers, some were sightseers, like those going to Huntington on a 1916 snow trip. Some were even filmmakers from Hollywood, because it wasn't too long before movie people discovered that the old SJ&E was custom made for shooting exciting melodramas. And scenes like that struggle on top of a tender packed them in at the local movie palace. Never a dull moment on the old SJ&E. No siree. Of course, if the Hollywood movie people had stuck around long enough, they could have filmed some real problems because the engines and cars had an annoying habit of running off the track. One train ran off the track five times in one trip. As we said, never a dull moment of the old SJ&E. Oh, the San Joaquin and Eastern was a mighty little line. It hauled both freight and people as the mountains it did climb. With smoke and noise, it did its part, the project to complete. And to this day, they'll tell you folks, it was a mighty feat. A mighty feat it was for sure. During its short 21-year lifetime, the little railway that it could carried thousands of passengers and more than 400,000 tons of machinery and supplies. And it carried them summer, fall, spring, and winter when the snow piled deep. Slow and jerky it may have been, but it was absolutely necessary, and it was absolutely unique. If you know where to look, you can still find relics of the railway today. Things like a long abandoned wooden trestle, rusty railroad rails, spikes, and a sad old bell that once rang so clearly so many years ago. But of all the railroad cars that once rattled up the mountain, there's only one left. Old caboose number 52, rotting away on a ranch near Friant. Its wheels are gone, and its ironwork is rusty. And it's hard to believe that it once clattered from El Prado to Big Creek behind a noisy shay. But if you're a real railroad fan, and you listen real hard, in your mind's ear you can still hear the whistle of those old locomotives as they rattled and roared and squealed up the Big Creek Canyon. But while the SJ&E was the steepest railway in the world, not even its powerful Shea engines could climb the last 2,000 feet up past Kirkhoff Dome to the Huntington Basin. So they fashioned a railway of another sort. While it had tracks and ties and cars, its power came from a 250 horsepower electric motor, winding and unwinding a heavy steel cable from a revolving drum in the hoist house far above. The cable was hooked to so-called strongback cars, like that rusty relic left in the forest, and pulled up the track. Although there's really nothing left of the original hoist house except the massive concrete slab to which it was anchored with those rusty bolts, a more recent hoist house was built to bring up parts and do maintenance on the present day system. In many ways, it's similar to the original, although its electric motor and cable drums are smaller. But its controls and signaling system are much like those in the original house, located higher up on the mountainside. 
Up in the Huntington Basin, work had been going on at a furious pace. The goal was to complete its dams in time to capture the snowmelt from the 1913 spring thaws. To speed construction, the basin had its own railroad to deliver materials from the gravel pits and sawmills and from one work site to another. Using nine engines, complete with machine shops and fuel stations, the operation went on 24 hours a day in order to meet the April deadline. Of course, when the lake filled with water, most of that equipment would be submerged and lost, but that was the least of anyone's worries. But getting the water to the powerhouses, then also under construction, required steel pipes of exceptional strength. As resident engineer Dave Redinger wrote later in his fine book, The Story of Big Creek, by far the most difficult engineering problem was the design and manufacture of steel pipe, strong enough to withstand the pressures generated by the water in its plunge to the powerhouses. In fact, the 2,000-foot drop from lake to powerhouse was the longest and steepest in the world. And at the time, only the steel foundries in Germany were equipped to supply pipes of the necessary strength. As Charlie Hull said, all of this special German-made penstock pipe had to come all the way around the tip of South America, around Cape Horn by ship, and all the way up to San Francisco. Then loaded onto flat cars and taken to Fresno, then loaded onto the special flat cars that were pulled up the SJ&E. And from the SJ&E to the Incline Railroad. But those penstocks, as they were called, were essential to deliver the most water at the greatest speed to turn the biggest turbines the fastest. And those turbines were located right there in powerhouse number one, just down the cliffs in Big Creek. Under construction since March 1913, Big Creek number one, as it is called, was built to house the turbines and generators to create the electric energy destined for Henry Huntington Street Railways, some 250 miles to the south. Back up at Huntington Basin, work was going on faster than ever before because the spring deadline for capturing the whole season's water flow was looming closer with every day. The weather was getting warmer, and the snow was beginning to melt. At last, on the morning of April the 8th, 1913, the sluice gates beneath Dam 1 were closed, and for the very first time in history, the waters of Big Creek were stopped, and the lake began to fill. Down rushed the water through the giant penstock pipes, down 2,000 feet to the powerhouse below, where the Pelton wheels and generators were waiting on the powerhouse floor, and operating today much as they did in 1913, when for the very first time, Big Creek number one went online. When asked about the water dashing from the powerhouse after turning the Pelton wheels, a young visitor once said, Oh, that's the water with all the electricity taken out. <laughs> Amusing, but not quite accurate, because that water has a lot more work to do in other powerhouses down the canyon, which is exactly why the Southern California Edison Company calls it the hardest working water in the world. So, 1913, the year the project went online and started paying for itself, Henry Huntington couldn't have liked it more. Fast forward to the Roaring Twenties, when ladies' hats looked like that, and the well-dressed man wore overcoats like that. For Christmas, Dad might have wanted a new radio, and the kids an electric train. For Mom, sure, give her a new lamp, sewing machine, or vacuum cleaner. The times had changed, and with them, the demand for more electricity to power all those radios, lamps, electric trains, and vacuum cleaners. Up in the mountains, where the Southern California Edison Company had taken over from Henry Huntington and his various associates, that meant enlarging the capacity of the lake by raising the dams, including also raising the lake's distinctive intake tower, which enclosed the gears and machinery used to operate the nine-foot tunnel gate under Dam 1. And most important of all, it required the blasting of the Florence Lake Tunnel. By far, the most spectacular feat of the entire Big Creek project. 
But first, thousands of tons of equipment and supplies had to be transported to the digging and blasting sites farther back in the higher mountains where the SJ&E couldn't possibly reach. Solution? Build a road over Kaiser Pass and supply the upper construction sites by truck. A mountain pioneer named Harry Allen built the road in just 56 days, and he was the first to drive his car over it in August of 1920. And the Mack Motor Company supplied the trucks. Not just any old trucks, but Mack Bulldogs, the state-of-the-art in heavy hauling equipment. They had chain drives, stiff springs, hard rubber tires, and steering wheels that were hard to turn. And boy, did they bounce. But bouncy or not, Mack Bulldogs were the backbone of the Edison transportation system. And sometimes, as many as 25 of them went bumper to bumper, hauling pipe or other loads over Kaiser Pass. So with Mack Bulldog supplying the materials to the backcountry, blasting on the tunnel began just before the snow flew in October of 1920. The idea was to blast and drill a 14-mile tunnel through the granite of Kaiser Pass between Huntington Lake and what would become Florence Lake. Originally called the Florence Lake Tunnel, we know it today as Ward Tunnel, and its waters thunder into Huntington Lake in a cascade of mist and spray. But before that could happen, almost five long years of difficult and dangerous work was necessary. It all began on October the 15th, 1920. Granite, that's what they faced, Sierra Granite cold, gray, and among the hardest rocks known. Blasting a tunnel through almost anything else would be easier. At first, the hole was small, then bigger, then big enough to admit railroad tracks and workmen with shovels, picks, drills, and dynamite. But it was started, and before it was finished, it would smash all world records for hard rock tunneling. But dangerous difficulties began almost immediately when they hit such unstable ground that heavy timbers had to be placed to brace the tunnel and shore it up. Nobody even wanted to think what would happen if the tunnel collapsed. But dangerous or not, it was drill, blast, and shovel. Drill, blast, and shovel. That was the cycle 24 hours a day. It was loud, dirty, and hazardous. As Dave Redinger wrote, to drill the dynamite holes, we used special steel rods, 15 feet long. But in solid granite, the drill points got dull within minutes, and we had to sharpen them all the time on special pneumatic sharpening machines. Because the fumes from gasoline engines would have been dangerous, the drill sharpeners and every other machine in the tunnel had to be run by compressed air. Even the steam shovels, whose beams were shortened to work in such a cramped space, were powered by compressed air. As the tunnel got longer, the men were so far underground that it wasn't practical to transport them in and out for meals. So we established a unique dining car service on the train, which took the food to the men. Not exactly lunch at the Waldorf, but the food was hot and hearty, and there was a lot of it. There had to be, because those tunnel men were doing the hardest work imaginable, and their appetites were huge, both in the tunnel and out, where they were fed in mess halls like that. Charlie Hull put it this way. Now, the only part of the camp that really was uh, pretty nice was the mess hall, because food was the most important thing to those men. So each of them had lovely big mess halls, nice and clean, uh, all the food that it would take to keep a crew of men working three shifts a day for a whole winter, and that was no small chore. Ham and eggs for breakfast? You bet. And plenty more, too. As Harry Allen's daughter Jackie remembers... The men were extremely well fed at breakfast time. I mean platters of ham and chops and biscuits and gravy and uh, uh, fried eggs, sometimes steaks. And all of it served by cooks and butchers who prepared two million pounds of fresh meat during the tunnel construction alone. Work hard, eat hard. That was the unspoken motto of the tunnel men. And if the food lacked perfection, the offending cooks were in danger of being run off the mountain. 
No fooling. I also remember an incident where um, one of the cooks was fired, and he was an excellent cook. Uh, but he was caught spitting in the frying pan to see if it was hot, and that was just a little too much. The men lived in tents or cabins, spread out over 32 separate camps from Huntington Lake to Florence. And during the peak tunneling months, there were about 3,000 workers altogether. When they had a precious day off, those who didn't go to the bright lights of Fresno stayed to attend a boxing match. But time for recreation was all too brief, and the tunnelers worked long hours in dangerous conditions. And it's not surprising that the company doctors and nurses had good use for the company hospital. But there wasn't one work-related death until February 1927. But then our luck ran out when an avalanche of snow roared down on a camp between Huntington and Shaver, wiping out those wooden cabins and bringing death to 13 people. Fire in the hole! Without dynamite, there simply would have been no tunnel. Pickaxes and shovels might be all right for cleaning up messy muck, but real progress would have been impossible. There were boxes and boxes of dynamite stacked near the work sites, some with printed warnings which most of the blasting men thought were funny. As they said, who in his right mind would shoot into dynamite or use it to kindle a fire? But with or without warnings, they used huge amounts of dynamite, or blasting gelatin as it was called. We were the biggest users of blasting gelatin in the world. I remember one order for 32 freight car loads. Someone figured that if the sticks were laid end to end, they would have reached from Los Angeles to the Hawaiian Islands. In most of the blasting, the dynamite was detonated by an electric switch, but they used a lot of fuse too. In fact, they used more than five million feet. And Dave Redinger figured that if it was lighted, it would take 10 years for the spark to go from one end to the other. Spring, summer, fall, winter. The work went on even if the snow drifts outside were deep. True, radio broadcasts were being sent to the camps, and the men could listen to the A&P Gypsies, the Clico Club Eskimos, or a sad-voiced baritone breaking their hearts with the prisoner song. But whatever the program, the men welcomed contact with the outside world because they were stranded in the snow with no way to get out or in. So my dad sent to Alaska uh, for a dog team and a driver, of course. Uh, uh, he got three beautiful dogs. Their names were Whiskey, Babe, and Tremor. And uh, Babe was the leader, uh, beautiful, gentle dogs. And uh, this, of course, was the only practical way in the wintertime to get supplies and mail to uh, the various lakes. The driver from Alaska was Jerry Dwyer. And in addition to Whiskey, Babe, and Trim, there were Patsy, Dooley, Riley, and Barney. Hush, you huskies! Actually, none of the dogs were huskies. Babe was half wolf. Nobody knew what the other dogs were, not even Jerry Dwyer. But Babe was the leader and most everyone's favorite, including Joan Murphy's mom, who was just a young lady at the time. That's right. Mom used to tell me how friendly Babe was and how much she liked to be petted. And she certainly was Jerry's favorite. No question about that. If they'd had a dog popularity contest, Babe would have won hands down. Fern Brophy Russell was just a little girl in those days, but she'll never forget Babe. Babe, I love that dog. She was so beautiful. She always greeted me with a smile and a wagging tail. I will never forget my friends, Jerry, and his love, Babe. Nobody ever knew much about Jerry, except that he loved his dogs and cared for them as though they were his children. He'd come from Alaska with his team. But about his background or personal life, no one had a clue, because Jerry was a loner, content to be with his dogs winter and summer. 
But when the drifts were high and the blizzards blew, Jerry and Babe, along with Whiskey, Trim, and the other dogs, were on the trail with the U.S. mail. On, Babe! On, girl! Maybe the whole thing was just too good to last. But in September of 1922, Babe died in Jerry's arms. And most of the tunnel men were about as sad as Jerry was. Other team leaders took Babe's place on the trail, but no other dog could take her place in their hearts. Jerry's sled with its mailbags is still preserved by the Southern California Edison Company, along with his boots and snowshoes. But of Jerry himself, only the legend remains, for no one knows where he went or how he died. But every mountain lover in these parts knows where Whiskey Babe and Trim are, because they're buried at the top of Kaiser Pass with a redwood slab to mark their grave and a poem to mark Babe's courage. On the topmost reach of Kaiser Crest, where the clouds commune and weep, in a granite tomb till the crack of doom, Babe lies in her last long sleep. When the tourist conquers the tortuous steeps with Kaiser Pass as his goal, he will pause and rest on the windswept crest where lies this dog with a soul. Sleep well, babe. You too, whiskey and trim. You've earned the rest. Back in the tunnel, the pace of work was accelerating, and the place was busier than ever with electric engines, muck cars, food cars, drill sharpeners, steam shovels, laborers, engineers, and dynamite men. They even had an occasional lady visitor. Hard to believe they had time to have their picture taken, but they did, and there they are, all looking at the camera and all welcoming a small break in their jobs. Most were young and single. Some had college degrees. Others could barely read or write. But they were all hard workers on a job that was grueling and dangerous. February the 16th, 1925. Getting close to the end now, and anxiety about the final tunnel breakthrough is high. Fire in the hole! Then, during the evening hours of February the 18th, the last shot was fired and the breakthrough finally happened. And it happened within three quarters of an inch from the point they planned four and a half years earlier. So the handshaking and congratulations were well deserved. You could almost hear the men cheering. And within a year, the reason for the cheering was on display for all to see when the high country waters of the brand new Florence Lake were turned into the tunnel to rush 14 underground miles and then roar into Huntington Lake. But even that wasn't the end of the project. Far from it. Beginning in 1927, Schaefer Lake, with its own history of sawmills, dams, locomotives, flumes, and early day recreation, was enlarged to become the biggest reservoir in the system, storing water when the other lakes were full. Then, over the years, still more powerhouses and lakes were added, culminating in 1987 with the incredible Eastwood Power Station, which was blasted out of solid granite more than 1,000 feet underground. As we watch the thundering waters of Ward Tunnel today, we can only imagine how proud it would have made John Eastwood, whose perfect ideas were so perfectly executed in the misty crystal glitter of the hardest working water in the world. But this is the story of mountain lakes, as well as the project that created them. The lakes themselves have dramatic stories, best told when the moon is full and evening campfires provide the mood. And the campfire story most often told by old timers in these parts is the legend of the lost bomber of Huntington Lake. It happened back in 1943, and it happened like this. December 1943, the country was at war around the world on land, sea, 
and in the air, where our combat crews were bringing the fight to enemy skies. Of the two big four-engine bombers they flew, one was the B-17, or Flying Fortress as it was called. The other was the Consolidated B-24, widely known as the Liberator. Desperately needed were the pilots, navigators, bombardiers, and gunners to fight the air war, and at bases all across the country. Aircrew training had gone into high gear as the men learned how to fly and fight. One such base was Hammer Field in Fresno, where members of the 461st Heavy Bomb Group got their final training before shipping overseas to fly combat missions. But in early December 1943, Hammer Field was shaken by the loss of two B-24s in mysterious circumstances over the Sierra and frantic search missions were mounted to find the bombers and the missing men. Among the crews at Hammerfield participating in the search were Captain Bill Darden of Portsmouth, Virginia, and Sergeant George Barulik, a radio operator gunner from Newark, New Jersey. Their plane, a consolidated B-24H, serial number 27674, nicknamed the Exterminator. Like all heavy bombers of World War II, the B-24 was a complicated plane to fly and learning its special flight characteristics could be far from easy. On its flight deck alone, there were at least a hundred separate controls, instruments, switches, and radios. But most pilots were soon at home behind its control wheels and could fly it skillfully. Among those pilots, Captain Bill Darden. But as he performed his pre-takeoff cockpit checks on the morning of December the 6th, 1943, Captain Darden had no way of knowing that this particular flight would be the last one he'd ever make. And that he and his plane would enter aviation lore as a mystery that would become a permanent part of mountain stories and legends. So, at 9.12 in the overcast morning of 6 December 1943, Darden's hand advanced the throttles of the B-24 for takeoff. Seconds later, the wheels broke ground and folded upward into the wings. Though no one on board could know it, neither the plane, its pilot, nor most of its crew would be seen again for years. No one will ever know exactly what happened, but within a half an hour of takeoff from Fresno, Darden and his plane were in fatal trouble over the Central Sierra. Desperately fighting to control his damaged plane, Darden ordered his crew to bail out while he searched for any possible place to crash land. But in the winter, in the Sierra, landing places are few and far between. And it was almost as though the plane had flown into winter clouds and disappeared. Because by 9.45 in the morning, all signs of the exterminator, Darden, and most of his crew were gone. Two years later, the war was over, and the world returned to the routine of peacetime living. Of Captain Darden, there had never been any word or sign. Searches by the Air Force had long since been abandoned, and the vanished plane forgotten, except for an occasional article in a magazine. Then, in August 1955, something extraordinary happened at Huntington Lake. To repair the dams, the sluice gates under the intake house had been opened to drain the lake. And there it was. B-24H, serial number 27674. Longtime mountain resident, Lauren Martin, was on the scene and remembered what was found. Well, the okay. tubes of the uh, fuselage were sticking up out of it, uh, out of the water and, and part of the uh, uh, fuselage. And, and then just, a, uh, oh, I guess about 50, 100 feet away, the uh, tail uh, section of the plane with the uh, rudders were sticking up so that we knew that the plane had broken in, in two and uh, it's about all we could uh, determine. Years later, attempts were made to raise the plane and some of its parts were brought to the surface by divers who hoped to exhibit the rusty engines, propellers, generator controls and other smashed equipment in some kind of museum in the valley. But the money ran out and interest lagged and most of the plane remained on the lake bottom. And once again, it seemed the exterminator had been forgotten. But not by everyone. At the Big Creek School under Kirkhoff Dome, 
Some of the students had been given a special assignment in history. Their job, find out all they could about the B-24 in Huntington Lake. With the hope that the Air Force had kept its records of the crash back in 1943, the students wrote to the military authorities with their questions. Not long afterward, they received their reply, which described the crash and the names of the crew, including the name of the sole survivor, radio gunner George Berulik, who, with the co-pilot, had bailed out of the exterminator seconds before it crashed on December 6, 1943. And that helped launch an exciting and memorable classroom project, as teacher Bob Kreider remembers so well. Okay, and as we did this, uh, I would tell the kids that what they were doing was different than any other fourth grade class in the country probably had ever done because we touched so many people and the the members of the 461st bomb group they were in awe of of the kids because the class cared about them and were interested in their war experiences. Later the students commissioned a beautiful color painting of the exterminator a copy of which now hangs in the Fresno Air Terminal and then, perhaps most memorable of all, they invited sole survivor George Barulik to return to the lake from his home in Florida in order to honor him and his six comrades who went down with the plane so many years ago. I got to meet the children yesterday, and uh, that was a great experience. So these children are not fourth graders anymore. They're, uh, I think they're freshmen now, and. Uh, it was just a touching experience to, that they uh, went through all this effort and to honor the, the six men. Uh, I, and I'm lost at words now to describe the feeling I got when I met these kids. And uh, I'm glad I'm here. Safe to say, Everyone was glad he was there. Before he left, George signed his name to a part of the wreckage. Then, finally, in a very emotional moment, Earl Roberts of the Rancheria Marina took him to the spot on the lake where he believed his plane had gone down. So, that's it. The story of the B-24 in Huntington Lake. Gone? but never to be forgotten, because the students at Big Creek School, together with the Forest Service and the Southern California Edison Company, dedicated a permanent plaque at the Eastwood Visitor Center to remind us always that a long time ago, some very brave men in an airplane gave their lives for their country, right here in our Sierras. Mountain campfire stories often tell of exciting and shivery things because it's always fun to scare the kids with the goblins of Grassy Flat or the mad scientist of Meta Lakes. And for mountain memories, there are stories of old cabins destroyed by snow or fallen trees or destroyed by fire like the old gingerbread house on Huntington's north side. But for sheer nostalgia, nothing much beats the stories of the perfect world that lay beyond those stone gates, the only remaining monument to a place of glorious memories for a dwindling few. It was called Sierra Summer School, and it was heaven on earth for those lucky enough to go there. Fresno State ran it from 1912 to 1948, and every single student who ever attended has treasured memories of the summers they spent at that lakeshore campus every day was pure gold, as Dory Graham King remembers. Oh, it was so much fun. Uh, a bunch of us gals all came up and, and camped here at Deer Creek. And uh, our social life, of course, all centered around the college at, in the campground, which was home. Loved every minute of it. We all do. Classes? Sure. Under a tent or under the sky. And every class taught by teachers who loved the mountains and who made student life a marvelous montage of work and play. A geology hike to Mushroom Rock? Absolutely. 
and organized to combine the best of science with the best of fun and fellowship. The lucky students on that academic adventure may not remember much about igneous rock, but they'll never forget their teachers or the view from the mountain crest. Classes in the morning and fun in the afternoon. That's the way they remember it, because that's the way it was. It was too perfect to last, of course. And in 1949, they shut it down because officials said it wasn't cost effective. And maybe the way officials calculate things, it wasn't. Nothing lasts forever. But ask anyone who attended that miraculous mountain campus, and you'll find memories that linger, constant and true. Memories they cherish. Sierra Summers. August 1994, and the forest was dry. The meadows, flowers, and ferns that were moist and green in June were brittle and dry as dust. And streams that raged only a few months before were slow-moving trickles. Throughout the forest at ranger stations and lookouts like Mount Tom, lonely fire spotters were on high alert for the first hint of smoke in unexpected places because August 1994 was the eighth month in the seventh year of record-breaking drought, and the forest fuels were about as ready to burn as gasoline. All they needed was something to set them off, and just about noon on August the 24th, that something happened. Sierra Mountain, I have a smoke at 210 degrees, 30 minutes, Township 7 South, range 25 East, Section 28, smoke is small in size, straight column of gray coming up, no drift at this time. With his firefinder at Mount Tom, the lookout positioned the location of the smoke, cross-checked with Music Mountain, plotted and confirmed at California Division of Forestry Stations where things began to happen fast. And at CDF stations and volunteer fire stations at Big Creek, Shaver, Auberry, and Huntington Lake, firefighters began suiting up, and their engines began rolling. From the very beginning, there was absolutely no question about the fire's location, because the smoke was plainly visible from Big Creek. Not all that far as the crow flies, or the fire burns. But at first, no one in Big Creek was especially worried, as Pastor John Coons of the Big Creek Community Church remembers. I mean, it was a carnival. It was uh, merriment. It was fun. Uh, this kind of excitement hadn't happened around here before. Though there was a tinge of fear, most of the people felt that, uh, oh, the Forest Service is going to get on that right away. They'll put it out. That we won't be endangered. This is kind of exciting. On day two, the fire was still roaring uphill through the brush and trees, and nobody could even guess when it might be controlled or contained. Engines and hotshot firefighters began arriving from all over. While they were doing their absolute best, the steep terrain and unpredictable winds made the Big Creek Fire, as it was named, a roaring disaster. They fought it with axes, picks, shovels, rakes, chainsaws, and everything else they had. During the day, it was hot, dirty, and dangerous. At night, it was cold, dirty, and dangerous. Day three, the air was smoky and the sun was red, and the fire was still out of control. And residents at Big Creek and other mountain sites were being ordered to evacuate. At windy moments, the fire was devouring the mountain faster than anyone could run. And the smoke was so thick, you couldn't see the flames coming on the ground. In the air, the helicopter and tanker pilots had better visibility as they dropped their loads of water and slurry. But they were in danger of another kind. What with smoke, gusty winds, and the presence of other aircraft, and the hazardous terrain, forest fire flying takes superb pilots and can be every bit as dangerous as combat flying.
While Huntington Lake was a great source for the water the choppers needed, Big Creek was even closer to the fire. So they put up a water tank at the helicopter pad at the end of the road. When minutes count, the shorter the trip, the better. In Big Creek, most of the residents had evacuated. But for those who stayed, this was the week that hell threatened, as Pastor John remembers so well. That was Saturday. We were down behind the house. The fire was coming up the hill. We uh, could feel it. We could hear it. We knew it was imminent, and we knew our moment was now. That was the day the streets of Big Creek ran red with fire retardant, and almost everyone who was still there was sure they'd lose their town. But they didn't. Thanks to the hard work and combined efforts of firefighters on the ground and the superb flying of firefighting pilots in the air, they finally had the fire under control. By the time the fire was licked and the engines could finally go home on August 29th, the fire had consumed more than 5,000 acres and had been fought by more than 2,000 firefighters, a total cost of more than $8 million. Left behind, black bark, black trees, black branches, charred bushes, and black ash. The TV reporters said it looked like a war zone from another planet. And in truth, it did. But for all its ferocity, the fire destroyed no homes or other structures, and no firefighter was seriously injured. Thanks were owed, and thanks were given. As Pastor John said, I came up from behind the house and I was just full of joy and jewel and I said, yeah, we got it, we beat it. And I went on up the street to the uh, other end and the fellas up there had likewise beaten it and they were kicked back, relaxing, and we were jubilant. We were uh, smiling, laughing, and uh, just really rejoicing over the fact that we had uh, beaten this fire and had stopped it from taking our tent. What started the Big Creek Fire of 1994? Not the usual causes of lightning, careless campers, or smokers. No, the Big Creek Fire was caused by a mountain squirrel like that, who had the fatal urge to investigate a high-voltage switch box, which turned him into an instant fireball and the forest into an instant inferno. All things considered, we'd rather our mountain fires were confined to the fireplace or to campfires burning in safe places under the moon on a starry night. Maybe John Muir said it best when he wrote, climb the mountains and get their good tidings, and nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into the trees. In this special part of the peaceful mountains, we're grateful that the historic project that provided electricity for Southern California has provided us with a glorious legacy of the lakes and mountain recreation without compare. The same horseback adventures enjoyed by John Eastwood at the turn of the century can be treasured today by riders at the DNF pack station, whatever their age. Pack trips or trail rides the horseback experience has changed little from the days that Eastwood packed his transits and tripods into the high country. Of course, skiing like that wasn't a part of winter living in the early construction days, but it's not hard to imagine that Jerry Dwyer could have had a lot of fun with a pair of skis in snow like that at Sierra Summit. And sailing in races with beautiful boats might not have figured too prominently in Eastwood's mind, but nothing's much more colorful than those spinnakers full of wind on the final leg of a Fresno Yacht Club race. And it's safe to say that all the old timers would have enjoyed that sight, just as everyone else does today. And they would have appreciated the woodcraft knowledge and skills taught at the scout camps on the south shore of Huntington Lake. Like this one at Camp Kern, where the ways of the outdoorsmen haven't been forgotten and mountain lore is a respected part of forest wisdom. For early day fun, mountain visitors often stayed and played at the old Huntington Lake Lodge, where rustic recreation was at its best, and there was plenty of fun for everyone, indoors or out. 
But since 1922, visitors have enjoyed the hospitality of the lodge at Lakeshore, built by the same Harry Allen who built the gingerbread house and the road over Kaiser Pass. And from that day to this, the Lakeshore Lodge has been a mountain landmark whose chandeliers, beamed ceilings, and dusty animal heads looked down on dances and slideshows, sing-alongs, movies, and fun and fellowship of all kinds. It's been a great many years since the last of the project workers left the mountains for home or other jobs. But while they were there, they performed a task so difficult, daunting, and dangerous, it was compared with the building of the Panama Canal. And no matter their education, skill, or specialty, they left behind a world-class engineering triumph and the lasting legacy of the lakes John Eastwood envisioned so long ago. For John Eastwood then, and all other nature lovers of these special mountains, Mark Twain had it just right when he wrote, the air is pure and fine, bracing and delicious, and why shouldn't it be? It's the same air the angels breathe. <laughs>